CODE is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And CODE is a project that helps us to interpret the information that's found in DNA sequences. This is a really important problem today because it's a bottleneck in a number of biomedical fields. For example, if we could do this better, we could better predict who's at risk for certain diseases. This information could also help us to design therapies for different diseases. So what ENCODE is doing is taking data, DNA sequence on the one hand, and learning about how to bridge that to wisdom. How do we get to understanding biology, disease studies, even human health? And ENCODE is doing this by having a large consortium, a group of people working collaboratively, scientists that have very different skills. And they're finding all of the different active parts of the genome. ENCODE doesn't perform these drug studies or do these disease studies. Rather, it enables some of them. So the human genome is three billion letters long. And how big is that if you say that correctly? Well, three, think about a large book like War and Peace. Alicia Oshlex told us that that's about three million letters. So you need a stack of 1,000 copies of War and Peace to get just one copy of your genome. That's a lot of copies of War and Peace in this room. So it's the 10th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project. The Smithsonian Institute, Smithsonian has a, a exhibit opening in June to celebrate this, and NHGRI has a symposium next week to celebrate this. At a personal level, something that it means to me is when I used to run a small research lab, this transition was happening, and it became indispensable to have this genome sequence available for daily work. Now it's hard for me to think back to what it was like when this information wasn't available all the time. It's kind of like telling my kids what it was like before there was an internet, or before we had smartphones. Human Genome Project's also been a very important engine for the American economy. So now, we can learn a lot of things by comparing different DNA sequences. We can learn about disease risk in people. We can also learn about our place in, in evolution. There are a number of things that set us apart from other animals. We use technology in our daily life. We also like to make music. We drink coffee. We spend a lot of time on recreation activities. Some of this information is encoded in our DNA, and it would be great if we could learn about where this all is. I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that everything we do is better than all of the other animals. I think that's not the case. There's a lot of things other animals can do that we can't. Some of those things are just fun to think about. Others might be really useful for us to learn about. For example, when we age, our immune systems decline, and this happens for pretty much every other animal. Now, I've got my pet turtle, Jinxie, up there because he can do something we can't. He can hibernate. And it turns out that when animals come out of hibernation, their immune system, their thymus, is rejuvenated to an extent. I've also got deer up there because they shed their antlers and regrow them every year. Part of doing this is having a nerve that grows all the way out to the tip of the antlers. We can't grow nerves at anywhere near that rate. If we understood how the genome codes for this information, we could have new ideas for working about nerve damage, dealing with ailing immune systems, and lots of other things that would be good for us to understand. So I'm going to draw the analogy to tell you about how ENCODE works by comparing mapping lights and switches. And that's, how en that's an analogy of how ENCODE is mapping the information in the genome. So if you looked at a small room, it would be very easy for you to find the lights and the switches. The same for walking around a small house. You wouldn't even think you were doing something challenging. Now think about looking at a huge building, 100 floors, right? You wander around, you're getting lost. You can't just look around and see stuff. There's going to be banks of circuit breakers, lots of switches everywhere. You probably need a large team of people to do this work. You probably need some automated, organized way to do this. And you have to remember to go up to the top floor where the view is great so that you see all the lights that are up there also. So now, in order to do this well, you'd probably notice that it's easier to see the lights when they're on. So you probably would want to map this building at different times of day. You'd want to go at night when the cleaning crews are there. You'd want to go during a fire drill when all of the emergency lights are on. Sometimes they're hard to see. This building, turns out, even has a special occasion code. And on the right, you could see it's lit up in blue for Autism Awareness Month. So now, at an intuitive level, we all map lights and switches all the time, and we don't think of it as some science project. On a small scale, you walk into a room, there's a bunch of switches, you find out which one that works. Sometimes you gloss over details, like one switch might turn on a bunch of lights in a chandelier. Other times, the same light's controlled by multiple switches, and you have to figure out how they all have to be. 
something interesting happens if you're mapping the lights and the switches at the same time. And this is how ENCODE is studying the genome. You can see correlations between the lights and switches. So even though your plan is to map lights and your plan is to map switches, you can also be mapping the connections of how they work. So you can reverse engineer the wiring plan. You can do the same thing with the genome with the same approach. So here's some molecular biology art. Here's some DNA, and here's some DNA being converted into protein. And in this analogy, proteins are kind of like the lights from the lights in the cells. All right? They're kind of easy to spot. It's relatively easy to figure out what they do. I'm glossing over this. I used to do protein biochemistry, but that's the analogy. If you look at different cells in your body, muscle cells have special proteins that allow muscles to generate force. So I can move my arm around. And neurons have special proteins that mediate electrical signals. And we think of this as thinking. Now, as Francis said, something really important is you basically have the same genome in every cell in your body. So how does this work? Different parts of the genome are on and off in different cell types. So you're using different parts of the information. Now, you might find it surprising that I say we have to learn how to interpret genomes. And we do have this really powerful tool, the genetic code. And it's fantastic for telling us about protein coding parts of the genome. The problem with the human genome for using this is only about 1% of the human genome's protein coding. The rest of it has this cool technical name called non-coding DNA. Years of studies before ENCODE and outside of ENCODE have taught us that at least some of the non-coding DNA is important. Most of the disease associations are in non-coding DNA. But today, we don't have a simple code to look at this non-coding DNA. So we don't know what parts of the non-coding DNA are important or what they do. So my colleagues, Elise Feingold and Peter Good, started the ENCODE project in 2003. And they assembled a team of hundreds of scientists. They have very different expertise, and they work together. And Elise is the director of this project. And I love working on this project. It's fantastic. I put in my little quiz thing that fun motivates me to work. And it's really fun learning how all of this stuff works. I can't say enough good things about my colleagues. So what is ENCODE doing? We're making a number of measurements. In standard genomics fashion, we're doing them comprehensively across the whole genome. We're not studying just specific regions that we think might be especially interesting. We make and report these measurements in standardized ways. Imagine you're driving around and using a map. You want the blue line in one square, if it means a road, to be the same thing in the next square, not a river. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. And we measure these properties in different cell states. Just like with lights, different parts of the genome are active in different cell types. All of these assays are done by using DNA sequencing as a detection method. One of the reasons that ENCODE is possible to do now is the dramatic drop in the cost of DNA sequencing. This is because of technology breakthroughs. So I'm going to show you a little bit of DNA sequence. This is about one two millionth of our DNA sequence. Can any of you see the protein coding regions or disease risk region? OK. <laughs> so I'll highlight protein coding regions here in yellow a disease risk region in red. And you can see a little box diagram on the bottom of that to see what, how we would code that, OK? When I look at this, I don't see any of this either. And I used to work on this locus for years. But this is not a problem today. Any undergraduate student that's interested in this kind of thing today can download the same kind of information I did in a few minutes. It took me a little longer because I'm out of practice with this stuff. But this doesn't tell us anything about how this might be involved in disease. So what happens if we add in some encode information? That red arrow is calling out where that disease region is. Now in those red boxes, you can see where there's ENCODE information. ENCODE information tells us that some of this DNA looks like it's active. Some of this DNA looks like it's switches, it's regulatory regions. And that little ellipse on the side is telling you that it's active in a particular cell type. And this is really important. If you just look at DNA sequence information, you have basically the same sequence in all of the cells in your body. So you can't tell what part of the information is important for what cell types. But these kinds of experiments can give us the specialized information. Another thing that ENCODE can do for us here is this switch-like area is in this red box. It matches up with this gene that's in the green box. You could design a plan to study that gene to learn about this disease risk for allergy and asthma. But something that ENCODE is able to tell us by tracking the lights and the switches at the same time is it looks like these switch regions are important for controlling the genes in the red box. 
okay? So imagine if you spent years trying to develop a therapy or an, a, a way to tell who's at risk for this, and you're looking at the wrong thing. To me, this is really exciting to be able to just call up this information. It's really fun to find this information. It's really easy once it's all been cataloged. It also reminds me of how painstaking and tedious it was to do it one gene at a time. So what does ENCODE deliver to biomedical scientists today? We have, a, we have a portal where we have different web tools for using ENCODE data. We share our methods of how the data was collected. There are a number of semi-automated tools that you can use to mine ENCODE data. I think this is really important because most disease findings map to non-coding DNA, the parts of DNA that are difficult to interpret. Okay? And many of these regions have ENCODE findings, so you can learn something about what they do. To date, there are over 200 publications that have used ENCODE data that come from people that are outside of the ENCODE project. So we think it's already starting to be widely used. But one grand challenge for the field is ENCODE is finding all of these elements, as it was charged to do, but ENCODE is not charged to figure out what do they all do and which ones are important. And this is going to take a lot of further work. So I'd like to leave you with a few ideas to sum up. And first of all, DNA contains lots of information basically the blueprint for life. Interpreting that information is not nearly so simple as it would seem, and it's a bottleneck in research today. But if we could get this information out, we could help people by telling them how to change their lifestyle to minimize their disease risk, or predict disease risk, or better learn how to develop therapies. So we're hoping that ENCODE can make these studies more efficient, and we can learn more about disease. Thank you.